<laughs> well, today we're going to help you create a better plan, a game plan to consistently prospect. We want to help you take some of the ouch out of it. And we have we have the best guy here to help us, PJ Nisbet. He's here. He's going to give us some simple tips that you can incorporate today. Seriously, I've gone through the deck, and there are some great things he's going to share. You can you can you can try these today. I want to tell you about PJ. He's a managing partner at Value Selling Associates. His experience and expertise in sales using the value selling methodology is pretty incredible. Take a look at his link. Take a look at his LinkedIn. I'm sure he'll share it later. Uh, you're going to see so many awards your head will spin. And you know, the one I want to point out is the Rainmaker Award. So we have PJ here. He's going to help us get a bit better at prospecting. And so I promise you're going to want to ask these questions and, and, and engage with PJ. So you know what, PJ? Take it away. Oh, thanks, Julie. Thanks so much. We really appreciate that uh, introduction. Looking forward to spending time with everyone. Thank you for giving your time up today to learn about, as Julie was saying, probably one of the most critical parts of the selling process. How do we build those top of the funnel uh, activities that build our pipeline? Exactly as Julie was saying, I don't think this is a natural process for most of us. We need to think about how do we do it? What's the art and the science of building enough top of the funnel activity that we can make our target or quota. And I'll flip between, uh, between a, a US approach and an EMEA Africa approach. We've got a lot of different people, so welcome. We've got, lot, I see people, lots of old friends, so, so nice to see you folks. We've got from, from uh, Spain and Mexico, Morocco, um, Scotland, the Netherlands, really good turnout. So thank you, folks. Okay, so let's think about this, um, how important this is initially. And then I'm gonna like this to be really interactive. So as Julie was saying, if you can pop your questions in the chat box, the Q and A box, we will pick those up at the end of the session. We all know, and I, I'm sure that's why you're on the session is how important this is. We probably have a target. Maybe it's, I don't know, a million euros or a million dollars or a million pounds or whatever it is. We know that we need to get enough cover in our pipeline to cover that target. Typically, people talk about three and a half times pipeline cover. So if I want to sell a million, I need to get three and a half million. How do I get the three and a half million? I need to do the math. And I'm sure most of you have done this. So think about what is my average deal size. Think about the sales cycle time. Think about um, how your conversion rates. You just think about factor all of those things in to say how many sales qualified leads do I need in order to fill my pipeline and you then you're going to have some some different activities around phone calls and emails and social and we're going to explain to you what those different touches are but we need to build it out it's like the art and the science of prospecting what is the science that is going to give you the number that you need in your pipeline? And then what is the art of actually doing it effectively? What is the quality going to be like? So that's where we're taking you. 40 minutes, lots of tips and tactics. I would love to start with a short poll. So just wondered, for those of you on the call, what is the most effective way of prospecting that you're finding right now? And I'm going to share with you some statistics later on, but would love to get a view from the audience today. So is it around social selling? Is it around email? Is it around the phone? Um, is it around networking events? Blind luck even. I haven't got anyone on blind luck yet, but we got a few people coming in. Fantastic. Good. Keep it coming in, folks. We've got about 40% of voted. Nice. I'll give you the results in a moment. None of the above, Robin is saying. Thank you. Hang on to that thought, Robin. Referrals are also very popular, aren't they? So when we say networking and events, we mean events like this. It could be a webinar. It could be a, an exhibition. could be something like that. The phone, the email, or social. And when you think social, let's think about LinkedIn. Let's think about Twitter. Let's think about Facebook, maybe, for some of you but generally it's going to be LinkedIn. Fantastic, folks. Good results. Let me share. We've got, oh, we've got a couple more going in. Let me share the results. What does that look like? 
Well, there you go. We've got about 23% social selling, uh, 22% email, good. 30% phone, love that. We're going to talk about the importance of the phone. And then networking, about 24%. So pretty even spread. And we've even got someone who just said blind luck. Love it. Fantastic. So we've got a good spread. And what we're trying to show here is that we need a strategically choreographed multi-touch approach. So all of these touches, social, email, phone, networking, we're going to talk about in a little more detail. So here are the results. You can see those very clearly there. Um, a widespread of results. Thank you for um, sharing those. And we, as I say, we're going to touch on all of these as we go through. Let me uh, let me um, ask you, or let, let me share with you a couple of uh, bits of bits of research that have come out recently about why prospecting is ineffective. Why why does it not work? And then I'm going to give you some nice tips around how to make it effective. So number one um, is perspective. We need buyers want to hear from sellers who can help them solve their problem. So this is selling with insight. It's doing the research, understanding what their business issues are, understanding the industry trends, and then really earning the right to ask the question and invite them to connect with you. Uh, but but it's, it's a... It's a um, I, I, I'm sure you're all like me. You get many, uh, many prospecting emails on, 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 your, on your LinkedIn profile, on your LinkedIn emails or emails. And it's just amazing at how bad so many of them are because they don't actually know what my problems are. And they're just what I would call spammy emails and spammy emails and really don't do our profession any favors at all. So number one is you need to make sure that you have the perspective of the buyer at heart. You need to avoid the, the, uh, the, the Gary Larson's uh, cartoon, which many of you may be familiar with Gary Larson on the far side, the um, great cartoon that he came out with where he, the, the story was that he, he goes out every day and he comes back and he sees his dog and, and what's happened is the dog Ginger has turned over the garbage can or, or, or the, the refuse bin in, in the kitchen and he's, he's coming in and he's saying, Hey, okay, Ginger, I've had it. You need to stay out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger, stay out of the garbage or else, Ginger. And he's saying this. And what is Ginger hearing? What do dogs hear? And so I know what my, my dogs hear. I'm sure your dogs are the same. They just hear their name. They hear Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger. So what we need to avoid in our prospecting outreach and when we're trying to sell value is the blah, blah, blah uh, kind of message that so often comes through. So we want to avoid blah, blah, Ginger. To do that, we need to sell with insight. Second reason, B2B buyers are five times more likely to engage with a sales professional who provides them new insights. So the whole idea, and many of you on this call have been on to, have been through value selling as a program, will know that that's essentially what we're trying to do by asking very purposeful questions around things perhaps that the buyers haven't thought about. So it's teaching them, it's teaching our sales team and asking our prospecting questions to think about really good purposeful probing problem questions that provide further insight about what might happen or what you could do for them. And again, it's about earning the right to engage, having the credibility, positioning yourself as a thought leader so you can actually uh, give them an insight into their business. <clears throat> and finally, the other research from HubSpot, um, the last one is from LinkedIn, this one from HubSpot, and there's, there's a lot of this research about, but this one is saying, and again, typically you might have seen some of these things before, um, people uh, don't listen, so, so the buyers indicate their top ways to create a positive sales experience is listen to their needs, and as we always say, you can't listen when you're talking, so stop talking and ask the question, don't be pushy. Don't be that pushy salesman, that cheesy salesman. Provide relevant information. So again, it's back to the other two bits of research. It's, I'm, I'm going to engage with you if I believe that what you're offering me is something that's highly relevant to my business uh, and, 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 and to my industry. And then finally, finally respond in a timely manner. So there's a lot of research that immediacy 
if I get a request, if I have a follow-up, the quicker you respond, the more likely you are to progress that opportunity. So it's, it's, a, it's a really, and it always surprises me that actually buyers say how poor the response rate is because you think that would be fairly obvious. So that's what the research is saying. What happened in COVID? Interesting statistics. For most of us, we were locked down 18 months ago or 16 months ago. Um, Accenture did some research around what happened to our prospecting outreaches during, during COVID. So on this, uh, in, on this left-hand uh, column here, we have pre-COVID, March 2019 to March 2020. And then on the right-hand side is what happened during that first lockdown, uh, which for most, I know every country was a little different, but for most countries or a lot of countries, it was kind of April to June. Some interesting stats. So, of course, um, you were basically phoning people at home. So the number of no answers dropped dramatically. The number of voicemails, of course, also dropped because you normally were able to get through to someone. The uh, conversion rates went down. Gatekeepers, of course, went down because they weren't gatekeepers for many people working from home. Interesting, though, was the number of emails sent. So emailing came back during lockdown. For many of us, we're moving out of lockdown, but it's but in some countries, this is still a really big factor. So, emailing and, and and these are trends which you need to watch and need to think about. You know, what's working? Is it social? Is it email? Is it phone call? But it appears that during the pandemic, emailing came back. Look at number of emails sent up twenty eight percent. This was a pretty big survey um, compared to pre COVID, down at five percent. Um, these next ones are pretty obvious, you know, the wrong number went down, the, the number of people you were able to connect to, so TCR is a targeted contact reached, increased slightly, again, maybe fairly obvious because you're phoning someone at home, um, number of disconnecting down, but then interestingly, email response came back also a lot higher, nearly 7% email response. So. These are, as I say, these are trends, these are st statistics. I would urge you when you're thinking about your prospecting strategy, Google, you know, what is, what, you know, what are the current stats? And, and they move all the time. They move every two or three months. Interestingly, interesting for me during the pandemic, emails came back stronger. What we believe, and we have a program, a wonderful program called Vortex Prospecting, and it's about creating a vortex. It's creating this whirlpool of activity to, prime memory. So this is based on a psychological principle called the mere exposure effect. And what the mere exposure effect says is that basically, if you are familiar with people or someone, uh, you're more likely to connect with them. And I think what we're saying is a common mistake in, in, in prospecting is to, uh, to give up after one or two uh, outreaches when you haven't primed memory, where you haven't built a, a cadence, a multi-touch approach. We would suggest that there are two ways to do this. First of all, think about your, what we call the sphere of influence. So think about all of the things that your company does and, and you'll have a marketing department, you'll have all sorts of things going on at, at events, you'll have things in the news. So what are the things as a business that your company is doing that you can leverage as a sales professional in, in in your outreach. So are there things, um, are there thought leadership articles? Are there customer success stories? Are there industry events? Looking closely in your, in your website, talking to your marketing colleagues. I'm always amazed how often marketing and sales work in completely different channels. The whole idea is they should be working together. And what we want to do is leverage those. And we call that the, the circle of the sphere of influence in order to populate our sphere of engagement. Sphere of engagement is actually what we do. These are the multi-touches. This is what we're suggesting. There are six different kinds of touches. The phone, of course, your network. So your, the people that you know, the people who you could speak to, pick up the phone and say, you know, you, I see you're my first connection. Can you introduce me to, to, to this person who I see is also a connection of you, yours? Maybe it's a second connection. So how do I leverage my network? How do I email? Of course, very important. Uh, groups, what groups do I belong to? Perhaps outside of work. So am I a member of a, a, a volunteer group or a charity 
or a kind of old, old school network, whatever it is, we all belong to groups and they're a very important part of perspective. We would say you should always be perspective, not to be the cheesy salesperson, but just to make sure that people know what you do and that they probably know people who have problems that we can solve. And then finally events, events like this, events, uh, uh, in-person events, and, and maybe those come back in, in, the, in the months to come, but very, very important of, um, that we consider these different aspects. And what we're doing is we're combining these. We're combining our circle, our sphere of influence with our sphere of engagement to create this kind of ripple effect that builds a, a, a cadence or a sequence and primes memory, yeah? Proper preparation, cannot uh, emphasize that enough. Uh, what I've just been speaking about requires preparation. And I'm gonna talk in a moment about time blocking. One of the hardest things about prospecting is actually allocating the time to execute. So if we're going to look at our, at our week, our, our work week, let's use time blocking to say, let's allocate part of our week to doing the research, do the research on the company, do the research on the industry, do the research on the individual so that you are selling with insight and you are adding value. This is about personalization, folks. It's about personalization and scale. How do we do that? Because the days of just sending out, you know, 50 emails that all look exactly the same are gone. We, and in order to personalize, we need to do research. A little rule of thumb for you uh, is 10 minutes on the industry, 10 minutes on the company, 10 minutes on the individual before you pick up the phone. The, the industry number might get less than 10 because as you, we, we would suggest to you when you're building your sequence that you would maybe do it by vertical. So your knowledge on the industry, your knowledge on the trends will get better and better as you focus on one industry. But there's so much information. And again, most of you on this call are, are pretty experienced and have been through value selling. You'll know that you know, that although selling can be hard in some ways, in other ways, it's quite easy because of the amount of information. So at least minimum 10 minutes on the company, looking at their financials, looking at their website, looking at their, uh, what's, what, 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 what's happened to their, their, um, their, their income the last two or three years, any changes in, 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 in senior people. So really researching on their website, on LinkedIn, we're great believers in Sales Navigator. I'm sure many people on this call are using a paid version of LinkedIn called Sales Navigator, hugely powerful. And you can really drill down by companies and, and obviously by the person. So absolutely critical. As I say, the days of turning up and, um, and, find, and saying, what is it that you do, I'm afraid have gone. Time blocking, as I say, if there is a silver bullet, it is probably in the time blocking. Nobody, and I think Julie alluded to this at the beginning, was, um, was uh, sets about doing prospecting um, and, uh, as a matter of course, and just like, like falls into it. Um, so uh, you need to allocate it, you need to be purposeful and say, I'm gonna spend you know, an hour a day, I'm going to spend uh, 20 minutes every morning when I wake up. I'm going to spend the whole of Monday morning, whatever it is, researching and really uh, setting that time aside. Because if you don't do that, for most of us, it does not come naturally. So let me ask you, uh, let me ask you another uh, question here, another little poll question. Um, how do you spend your week? Think about an average week. And I'd like you to rank the most important activities um, that you that you're, you're, you're currently doing. So think about an average week and give me a score there. Mm, lots of people, fantastic. Very good. So we've got about 40% in, 40% voted, very good. Fascinated by this one. Where do you spend in your busy weeks? Most of us get locked into all sorts of internal meetings. It's looking quite high internal meetings. I'll show you the results in a moment, but um, 
And it's a quite a scary exercise when you, when you actually figure out how much time do I spend with my customers? Okay, very good. I think we are just about there. We got a two third uh, vote on that. Here is the results. Uh, and as we suspected, 32% internal meetings and phone calls. How scary is that? External meetings, 20%, a day a week, external meetings, client facing. Prospecting activities, less was about the same, also about a day a week, yeah. Um, and then emails administration, 20% and other, a couple of people doing other things. But yeah, interesting statistics, too many uh, internal meetings. And as uh, Ryan is saying, thank you, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, not enough time on prospecting. Fantastic. So our suggestion, and this will be a little takeout, and, and uh, um, we will um, share this deck with you so, so you have this as an ongoing resource, is, is, is take a good look at your week. And then from a prospecting point of view, think about what are the things that we need to be doing. And I'm going to unpack these. I'm going to explain more about what the cadence is in a moment. But essentially, what I was talking about earlier, about research, uh, about list preparation, for most of us to, to clean the list, to get clean data, to get really targeted information is really important and takes time. Research it, research the companies, research the industry, uh, update your CRMs. We would suggest from a core block point of view that you're not doing your CRM updates as you do the core block. The core block, and I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, absolutely crucial uh, prospecting activity do that for 60 minutes, call 100 numbers, and then after you've done that, update your CRM. What happens, and we find this in our Vortex training, is if you're doing that at the same time, people are wasting time. Instead of dialing, they're updating the CRM. So rather allocate time, whatever works for you, in order to update and make sure that the CRM is accurate. And of course, it is crucial to keep the CRM accurate. We always say, if it's not, if it's not in the CRM, it didn't happen. So be really sure to keep your CRM up to date. Cadence creation and email personalization. I'm going to talk to you about how do you do that. Thinking about your sphere of understanding. So think about that sphere of influence. What are the things in the company that the marketing department's producing that we're going to be doing new product launches? Thinking about those and, and also maybe third party assets. What is going on in the industry that I can share to populate my cadence? And then, of course, there's a reflective piece. How did that go? If I called 100 numbers, if I dialed 100 numbers, how many conversations did I have? Of the conversations, how many of them converted into some kind of discovery or exploratory call? Maybe a bit of practice. And for those of you who are new to the prospecting game, I think particularly the phone, it's a great thing to practice it. Just, just practice it, get comfortable with it, get confident with that calling and spend time on training and maybe doing role plays with colleagues. So this whole, how do I get better at this is an important area to set aside. Maybe it's a, a Friday a Friday lunch. Uh, if we could get back in the office, that would be nice. Sit around the table, do some role plays um, and, and just try it out. Get, get comfortable, get your muscle memory right for making really good calls. So time block your week. This is about creating focus and really thinking about how, how do I work smart rather than work hard? How do I uh, time block my, my, my Outlook calendar, whichever calendar you're using and say, I'm gonna spend these three or four hours really thinking about how to do this better. How do we develop the cadences? Well, as I said earlier, cadences are a strategically choreographed series of interactions across multiple challenges, so we're going to, uh, channels. So we're going across all six channels and what we're trying to do is through priming memory, we're trying to increase the probability of connection and conversation. So we're not asking on the first email, we are giving things of value. And what we believe strongly is that that cadence, we're trying to create value interruptions. Every time you get a phone call, every time you get an email, that is an interruption. And what we're saying is from a prospecting point of view, we should be adding value with every single one of those touch points. And particularly at the early stages of a, a cadence, um, that you should be really adding value and not asking for anything. This is about respectful persistence. This is about 
adding value to your outreach and, and, and doing this in a, in, in a scientific way. We, uh, a little uh, template we can share with you again is something we call the AIM process. So the AIM process stands for anxiety, influence and motivation. And what we're saying is when you're constructing your emails, when you're leaving a voicemail, when you're making a phone call, think about a simple structure, which is saying we work with other people just like you and, and, and mention the job title. So I think that's, that's quite a good tactic. I work with CIOs, helping them solve the biggest concerns, such as escalating storage costs and cybersecurity, for example. I recently helped one of my customers uh, reduce their cost of storage by 40% um, and ensure they were 100% compliance. And it would be great to have an opportunity to discuss some approaches with you. Very simple structure. Of course, you can elaborate on that. You can, you can uh, but don't make it too long. But what we're trying to do is to just get a little bit of anxiety. So this is a problem which I'm likely to have if I'm in this role. I worked with someone just like you and we were able to achieve this value. And then my call to action, my motivation is, can we have a conversation about this? So the, 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 it's the, the anxiety, influence and motivation. How do we build the cadences? Well, folks, interesting topic. And there, again, a lot of research on the internet about this and, and this changes. Typically, uh, and I think this is the consensus, that 15 to 17 touches across 22 to 24 business days is what you need to connect with a client. Now, some of us might say, well, that sounds quite excessive. That sounds like stalking. Um, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about these touches can be any of those things. So it could be social, it could be an email, it could be another email, it could be another social. After four or five touches, it could be a phone call. But the research is that 15 to 17 touches across a month or so is what gets results. However, I think it depends on what you are selling. So you could even be more aggressive and I, I think this may be for short sales cycle, maybe consumer goods. If you were selling, um, you know, water purifiers door to door, maybe not door to door, but 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 like, like a really short sales cycle, a commodity type sale, maybe it's very aggressive. For some of us, it might be intermediate, what we call intermediate, two or three touches a week. And then for others, longer sales cycle, more relational, three, four to five touches per month. So you need to think about what am I selling? What is my sales cycle? Uh, and then take an appropriate view on how many touches over how many days. A lot of my clients that I work with on board is prospecting would typically be in this intermediate phase. So three touches a week, uh, and there's maybe a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, and, and, and you're building, and, and then you're building that out and maybe going, and I'm gonna show you an example of this, you know, maybe over, over, over a month or so. The important point here is that we're not selling for the first two or three touches. The, so your social interaction might be um, liking something that they that, that your prospect has has, has done on, on, on LinkedIn. So just saying that's a great comment. Then your social, second social interaction might be trying to connect with them, maybe sending them something useful. The email might, your first email might be including a third party asset, which adds value to them. Uh, and then you might make a call. But you'll notice here that in the first three or four touches, we are not asking. We are just creating, we're priming memory, we're positioning ourselves as a thought leader. As we progress, our aim, anxiety, influence, motivation comes into play. We might have some market insight, we might have some references. And then eventually, as we get to five, six, seven touches, would be the ask. Why, 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 why change? Why now? Why us? And you're going to develop that out. How does that look in reality? And again, we're happy to, to share this with you and, 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 and talk more about this. But again, you know, the first social interaction might just be um, a, a LinkedIn uh, connection. Then, then you might, um, after LinkedIn connection, you might then um, try and connect with them maybe give them an insight in the industry. Um, 
build to your first phone call is after four touches. If they're not there, then you might go to a voicemail. In more detail, and as I say, I'm happy to, to, to connect with you afterwards and share this kind of basic um, Excel uh, framework. This is an example from, from, from one, of, uh, one, one of my clients uh, where we're saying, just think about the cadence. You'll notice there's a problem focus on here. So this is a company that, that is in the data, data management, data storage. So their problem focus is around ransomware initially, and then it's around cost of storage, and then it's around compliance. This is an intermediate, so there's a, uh, a kind of Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but you'll notice at the bottom, it changes, the phone calls change because they don't want to call on, a, on, a, on a, a Wednesday every day. We're going to try a Tuesday, we're going to try a Thursday. So maybe change up the days you call because it's, that's good practice. Uh, but your, the, the point is that we are priming memory and we're using lots of different touches to the end. At the end of the cycle, if you, and, and typically we would create sprints of the number of people. So we might do this for maybe 10 or 20 customers at a time. Uh, and again, I would be very careful that you're personalizing these. So what I'm not saying is create 20 emails and shoot them out. Each one needs to be personalized for, 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 for that industry and that customer. We might run 20 customers through this and then we're gonna recycle. If there's no response, after the, at the end of the sequence, at the end of the, uh, say 27 uh, or 15 touches over, 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 over a month, then what we might do is say, well, let's put them on one side for 90 days and we'll come back to it and see if the world has changed. I would, I would suggest that uh, account-based cadences are, are, are already valuable, that um, if, you're, if you're using the account-based approach, uh, take a good look at that account plan, use things like Sales Navigator, figure out who are the key people in that account, and then build a cadence to access those different power people. And those cadences might be different. Typically in Vortex, we, we, we give the cadences different names. So this, for example, is one where we use the hair metal uh, cadence. Um, well, not that aggressive, but, but I mean, a, a social, an email, a call, a voicemail. Um, the Dr. Sears one, about the same. The Batman's back looks a little more aggressive. So you can tailor these cadences according to the different personas and the different solution sets and buying cycles that you are working on. But the, the, the idea is that you really um, think about this carefully and then automate the cadence process so that you can actually do it at scale, but at the same time, make sure that you are personalized. One of the beauties of, of where we are now in, in the sales world, although it is tough with virtual selling and, and, and you know, selling can be difficult, is that there are some wonderful tools out there to help you. So think about your tech stack. Think I've mentioned Sales Navigator two or three times. I mean, it's a wonderful tool. Things like Cognizism, Highspot, Seismic. You know, uh, there's so many tools out there that can help us to personalize at scale and to do this really effectively. 